2 Samuel chapter 3, and we will either read along or listen along as best we can uh, with uh, those verses. So we want to start off, I could have um, my reader could start in, and just give me the verse 1 through 5, and it will start there. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron. And his firstborn was Amnon of Hanoam, the Jezreelite, and the second, Chiliad of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maka, the daughter of Talmud, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ephraim, by Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in heaven. Now, I apologize to Brother uh, McKinley before we started, because I, I saw that list of names coming, and my heart went out for him. But he did a great job, and I appreciate it. Um, but what we want to try to start off is we remember from chapter 2, this is continuing the rivalry, um, this strange kind of dual kingship, this, uh, 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 this rift in Israel as they, are, they, have, they have one king who God has appointed, and you have another king that is being appointed um, by just the strength of will and the sword. So you see Saul's family uh, still hanging on to power with the help of Abner, who we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But then we also have David, who has now uh, gone and resided for seven years in Hebron. And while he is there, God has blessed him that he with his uh, wives have uh, given him six sons over those seven years. Now, the first thing I guess to try to point out is that even in that list of sons, if you see who the mothers of those sons are, that none of them are the same. So that in itself uh, creates its own set of, of uh, difficulties. And if uh, we remember back there in Deuteronomy, it was one of those things, even before Israel had a king, that the Lord said that a king is not a good idea for a king to have too many wives. And as you see later on, those of you that, those Bible scholars out there, that already recognize some of the names of those sons, you can understand uh, that they are going to be very different men having been raised in very different ways by different parents. So it is one of those things that, just, that complicates uh, David's life later on. But we see already that even though that's something that God had already spoken against, he does not intervene. He does not come out and uh, say to David right away, hey, this, is, this pleases me. This is what kings do. This is what kings do. This is what uh, the Lord said kings would do when Israel chose them. And so he doesn't bother to get in between that. But later on, we'll begin to see what the fruits of that look like. So um, let's go down. Let's let me have verse 6 and 7. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ahiah. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? It's a strange thing. Power does strange things to people. So now, how is it that uh, Ishbosheth is managing to hold on against a king that has been anointed by God, who has the favor of most in recent times past, has proven himself a hero? How is he able to maintain power? And it is mostly because of Abner. And while David has been in repose in Hebron, Abner has been continuing to to consolidate the power that comes from Saul's house and to make himself a great man. And as you can see, as you've seen it before, even even at work, you understand that there are people that will take advantage of weak leaders. They will take advantage of an opportunity to make themselves look good because you're going to find out something about Abner later on, that there are things that Abner knows and understands that he is not acting on so that he can take advantage of this opportunity for himself. So we'll see that in a minute. So the first thing he does, like I said, power is a very strange thing. 
So because he's become a great man and uh, probably greater in power than this, the, uh, the supposed king or, or the, the son of Saul, he goes ahead and takes a liberty. Let's call it a liberty. And he seeks out the concubine of Saul. Now, Saul is long gone, right? But um, strangely enough, there, is, there, are, there are concubines and there are concubines. So uh, a woman that's been taken by a, a king is considered a royal concubine. And if you, de- if you decide to, to take up with her, in some instances it can be seen as an act of treason. But for sure it is an overstepping. But why would Abner think he could do that? Because he can do anything he wants. He has the might, he has the power, he controls the army, he controls the forces that keep Saul's family in power. So we see he does that, but it doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't go unnoticed. So, and uh, Saul's so son, Ishbosheth, comes and says, well, you know, why did you do that? What's that about? You know, who do you, th- who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? Now, you've seen it before. You've seen it at work. You've seen it in your families. You've seen it in your favorite television show. Because believe me or not, uh, when you read Kings and it's so much like a soap opera. It's better than any stories. It's just as good as Godly Night in Search for Tomorrow. So you can kind of guess what's going to happen after this. So um, let's go on. Give me the next uh, two verses, Brother McKinley. Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth, and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do shoot kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father? to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a thought concerning this woman? So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord have sworn to David, even so I do to him. Go right ahead, bro. Give me to me, I have 10 as well. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. So after Ishbosheth comes and says, I object to you being with my father's concubine. He says, Well, I object to you getting in my face. Who do I think I am? Who do you who do you think I am? I am the one that has been setting that's been putting his life at risk, being loyal to your family, your brothers, your friends, your kinsmen. I am the one that's keeping this whole thing afloat. And then he just gets an inkling. You know what? I'll tell you what. You don't have to worry about me no more. No more. And he makes a vow. You're going to see a lot of vows happening in this chapter. But he says, you know what? I will turn this entire thing back over to David. And if I, if I, and by the way, if I don't do it, then I'll allow the God, I'd rather God curse me if I don't do it. All right, let me have verse uh, 11, Brother Bukin. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. So you already see what the problem is. Here is the man that is the, the king, and he is afraid of his greatest general. So even so, he was offended enough to try to step to Abner, and Abner says, you know what? You don't have to worry about it anymore. I will just turn my back on you all, and then you'll see how good it is. Because who do you think I am? All right? Um, let's, let's go a little further, Brother McKinley. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee to bring about all Israel unto thee. So he makes good on his, on his promise, right? He is already going to start contacting David. He is already going to start making reconciliation because this is not a, a power that's imagined. This is real live power that comes with the might of the sword. And Abner is nobody to be played with. None of these people, as we see in the chapter, and we'll talk about it near the end, um, These are bloodthirsty men. These are men of war. These are men who will kill at the drop of a hat. What's the solution? 
kill them. Yes, that will, that will solve it all. These are the kind of men that are, that, that are Abner, and as you'll later see, Joab. Uh, so he, he has that power, and he sends messages to David, and he's saying, you know, whose land is this? Is it yours? Or is it Saul's family? Let's see. Let's see. I'm going to the next, the next verse, Will McKinley. And he said, well, I will make a league with thee, but one thing I require of thee, that is, thou shalt not see my face, except thou first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when thou comest to see my face. All right, now we're going, we're going back a few steps. We're going back a few steps. David says, I like your proposal. I will accept it, but I don't want to see you unless you have my wife, in tow. Now, if you remember, Michael is the daughter of whom? Saul. Saul. And remember that she was promised to David. Right? But then later on, Saul withdrew her just to get on David's nerves and to, to, to try to pull his strings. So he says, I will, I will meet with you, but by the way, have my wife when you come. Keep on going, Mother McKinley. And David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, saying, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife Michael, which I espouse to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Faltiel, the son of Laish. So there's a little bit of a wrinkle. <laughs> so Michael has already has another husband. But just to show you, just, just to show you, and these are wonderful character studies, because just to show you David, and just to show you Abner, he says, if you're going to show up here, bring my wife. Abner's like, no problem. No problem. Faltiao, pack the bags. Michael, pack your bag. We got to stop to me. So here they are on their way to go to make good on the promise and secure this meeting with David. Go ahead, Brother McKinley. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her to Behirim. Then said Abner unto him, go, return. And he returned. Now that's cold. <laughs> that's cold. It was not that Michael was, you know, pining over David. Oh, I could have been the wife of a king. I could have been out there with exploits and those kind of things. It was, that was not the thing at all. She was, for all intent and purposes, a happily married woman. How do we know? Because when he said, bring me my wife, the husband went after. And can, you can see him, and you can see the caravan now coming. You know, Abner and his men and his garrison, uh, the, the, the gifts for whoever the kings... To, to appease him, his wife, Bronnie has a gift, and, and there he is in the back, just kind of trailing, looking sad. So what happens when Abner sees him? Oh, man, it's, it's all right. Oh, man, we'll find you a new wife. It's just like, son, go, go home. Go home. You in the back, crying. Go home. That's, that's Abner. That's a cold brother. This is already a done deal. He's trying, to get, he's trying to get some things accomplished. Now keep in mind that all of this is still how God is bringing about the things that he promised. Wow. You know, people always ask, and they look at the world for as strange as the world is, they say, why and oh why is the world like this? Why does God allow this? It's just like the answer is I allow it because I allow it. But it's serving a purpose. It's all bringing about a plan that is greater than us, that we cannot see. But it is far from out of his control. He just simply allows people to be who they decide they want to be. So, and these men, you can see, are fully formed, able to make their own decisions and do. God will also have the final world, as we'll see. Let's go on a little further, Brother McKinley. And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now then do it. For the Lord hath spoken of David, saying, 
By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. Now, remember I said that Abner knew something that he was not acting on? It was never that Abner was loyal to Ishbosheth or that he did not understand who David was. You can see that when he goes to talk to the elders, he explains exactly who David is. This is God's anointed. This is the person that God's going to bring about to drive the Philistines out of our hair. And he says, once upon a time, you wanted to make him king. So now get to it. Get to it. He is the one that is. This also tells you a little bit about Israel. Because where was the fervor for David when Saul was chasing him all over the countryside? They know where David is. He's in Hebron. They understand that there's a rift, that there's, but where is the fervor for, for God's anointed that was once there? It's not there. It takes Abner to come and to whip everybody up and to bring the, uh, to bring the people into action, and bring the elders together and mobilize them to do and to bring about the blessing that God says he wants them to have in the first place. All right, let's see anything else up there. Let's go on a little further, brother. And Abner also spake in the ears of Benjamin. And Abner went also to speak in the ears of David in Hebron. All that seemed of good to Israel, and all, I'm sorry, excuse me, and that seemed of good to the house of Benjamin. Keep going. So Abner came to David to Hebron, and 20 men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. And Abner said unto David, I will go, I will arise and go, and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desire. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Now this, the last line, that's the tricky one, is that he sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Now up until now, if there was a post office, in the, Hebron, uh, uh, in, in the city of Hebron, when it has the most wanted, Abner's face would be on, right on the poster. There's no more dangerous or threatening man to, to David's reign than the general under Saul's sons. But yet David brings him down. He makes a feast for him. And then after talking business, he says, okay, that's a good deal. You're going to go and talk to the people? You're going to go and politic for me? You're going to go and mobilize the forces for me? No problem. Safe passage. Safe passage. Let's see what happens after that. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. Now, after, while David is feasting with Abner, Joab and his forces are out doing what they do. They're out there on a raid. They're out there fighting. And not only do they come back, they come back with spoils. We have been out there fighting. We have won a great victory. And what do they find out? Who was here? And he's where now? Keep on going, Brother McKinley. When Joab and all the hosts that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he hath sent him away, and he is gone in peace. Now, if it's one person that was not going to be a fan of Abner, it is Joab. Does anybody remember why he had killed his brother? Now, to be fair, his brother had it coming. His brother had it coming. Abner tried to tell him, it's like, son, you don't want any of this. But Joab's brother, he wanted, he wanted as much smoke as he could carry. So, uh, and so Abner did kill him. But Joab is Joab. These are not, this is not Mr. Rogers and Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> These are not men to be played with. They have short tempers, long memories. So he already knows, so he hears that the enemy, the enemy has been here eating, sitting in my seat. And now you have let him go in peace. 
Now you can imagine now, like I said, all of these things kind of give us clues into each man's character. Joab, Abner, they are fighting men, they are warriors, they are men of war, they are killers. But still, Joab works for David. So what does that say about David? Joab, you may, you may, you may run your mouth a little bit, Joab, but, but watch it. Watch it. I didn't gain my wife for playing, uh, playing, playing dice and tiddlywinks. So David is a man that has his limit as well. But also is that there's, a, there's a wonderful thing about David that we'll see later on that he learned a long time ago about his relationship with the Lord. And it even, uh, 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 it even overshadows us uh, as far as what God says he will do and how he says he will do it. So nonetheless, he says, all right, I'm, he's outraged. Um, Abner was here. He was here. Now he's gone. Let's keep on going. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and to know thy going out and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. So he is seeing Abner only through the lens of the enemy. How could you let him in here? How could you let him see our forces? How can you let him know our plans? How can you sit and make a league with him? How can you do that? Don't you know he is just trying to get an advantage? Now, how come that he couldn't understand what David was doing? No, Abner is going to, he's going to set us up, man. He's going to talk to the people. He is going to rally the troops. He's going to bring an end to all this infighting. How come Joab could not see that? because he is looking right through his own lens and he is imagining that Abner is the same kind of man as he is. Who would do that? Who would do that? How could you do it, David, that you brought him in here? Right? Because he, and he's, he's not wrong. That's the thing. He is not wrong. He and Abner are cut from the same cloth. Right? So we'll see that, how that ends up in just a little while. All you Bible scholars out there, you already know. But we'll, we'll go along just because it's Wednesday night. Uh, <laughs> go on, Brother McKinley. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sarah. But David knew it not. All right, so Abner decides, I will handle this myself. Since you're not man enough to do what's got to be done, I'll handle this myself. Right, so he sends he sends for Abner. Oh, excuse for for Joab. Thank you. Joab sends for Abner, keeps David out of the loop. Uh, what's the next one, brother McKim? And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly, and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died, for the blood of Ash Asahel his brother. Now. In Hebron, where David is residing, and one of the reasons why David can become to such, uh, uh, such peaceful and affluence and raise a family is because Hebron is one of the cities of refuge. So in the cities of refuge, uh, you're not allowed to take vengeance on people, especially when things have happened in self-defense, like with Asael and with Abner. He pursued Abner. Abner, in self-defense, killed him. He should have been safe as a house in Hebron. And Joab knew it. Joab knew it. So he tells him to, rather than go and find him and risk life and limb, he says, all right, come back here. we got a few more things to work out. Certainly, if you think about it, Abner reached across the aisle to David. David said, I'm fine. We had a nice meal, we had a good talk, everything is fine. So Abner is returning to Hebron, which should be a safe place. What do you think is on his mind? Peace and safety. We worked it all out. What does Joab do? Something that is probably out of uh, uh, character for him, it says uh, uh, Abner was returned to Hebron and Joab took him aside in the gate 
and speak with him quietly. No swords drawn, right? No forces, no, no, uh, no, no, no uh, 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 guards. He says, I've got just a few details I need to work out with you about this thing you worked out. And so he very quietly walks along and speaking very quietly with Abner, walks him out of Hebron. Right out, as soon as they get outside the gate, no great battle. He does not pull a sword and say, I challenge you for the life of my brother. He does not give him even a chance. While we're still talking, you know what? Uh, one other thing. Lean in. No sword, no spear, no duel, no battle. Just right between the ribs. And he is dead. That's for my brother. That's for my brother. Never mind that he is supposed to be the, the, the head of the spear in bringing the people back to David. That David had already agreed to that. Never mind that David, the king, had already given his word that there would not be this violence. Never mind that in Hebron, that is not a thing. There's no killing. There's no revenging here. So what does he do? And you've all seen it, those of us. Uh, some of you that spend a little time on Instagram and you see those fight videos where it's just a, a, a boxer comes out, says touch gloves, and punches somebody in the face and knocks them down. Only I waste my time like that, I guess. <laughs> but you see it. It's, a, it's as cheap a shot and as far below Abner as, as for a fighting man to die like that. And it's just as far below Joab to kill him like that, especially after David had made him an ally. So we'll, <coughs> we'll see uh, David's commentary on it in a little bit. Time is getting away, but we got, we're almost there. Uh, go on, Brother McKim. And after when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Why do you think that David wanted his wife back. Why do you think he wanted to have Michael back? Remember who Michael is. He is out there in battle or political battle with Ishbosheth, the son of Saul. Michael is the daughter of Saul. Why do you think that David wanted his wife back? Yes. David is trying to say, and David, did David ever have anything against Saul? Saul wanted to kill him. He is trying to make as much as he can, perhaps an olive branch to say, see, I don't have anything against the family. The only claim that Ishbosheth has to the throne is that he is Saul's son. If David comes in and he reigns alongside Michael, he reigns as a son-in-law of Saul. So now, though, all that he's trying to establish is being undercut by Joab. And so when Joab is killed and he has been among the people trying to bring about peace and they've heard his message, the elders have heard Abner say, I am trying to establish David. Now David, in the face of this murder, has to say, that's not me. That's on him. I am, that's not me. That's not what I'm about. You all know better than that. And he has to distance himself from that. You ever have anybody like that at, at maybe at your job where you know it's supposed to be done a certain way and you try to tell them, you know, it's not supposed to be, you know, left, right, left, it's supposed to be right, left, right. It's like, man, don't tell me, all right, fine. <laughs> and then your boss comes and he knows, you know, it's like, who did this? And you had to say, it's not me. You don't even say who it is. You just say, it's not me. <laughs> it wasn't me. You saw when you were a child, somebody left the door open. Your father come up, who left the door? It wasn't me. 
It wasn't me. I came in. It was about four or five of them still outside. I, I always lock the door, Dad. Because you don't want the wrath to come upon you. So David is trying to distance himself from this. And you'll see how far he goes to try to establish that. Let's go to the next one. Let it rest on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. Mm. And let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. He is wishing every bad thing that he can think of. It's like, I hope, there's, I hope that none of the men in your family, I hope they're full of just poor, drunk, beaten down, unhealthy slobs in, throughout your generation. I, I don't wish anything good on any of your family. All right? And, uh, and, and it's his position as king and uh, the anointed king under God. This is not a light statement. And like I said, for those of my Bible scholars out there who know what happened to Joab, you understand, what, you understand this. Uh, let's go to the next one. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And the king himself followed the buyer. So they, they have a funeral for Abner. The David, David makes as great of, uh, makes plenty of pomp and circumstance to bury him, to lay him at rest in Hebron to show that this is not my idea. This is, and to, and to also kind of raise Abner up once again amongst the people. He doesn't tear him down. Well, that was a traitor anyway. I would have gotten rid of him as soon as I got it back in the power anyway. He says, no, this was a great man that we have lost. And he deserves better than he got. We'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, Brother McKinley. Let's see. And they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a, as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put in feathers. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept again over him. So he... he he, def he goes out of his way to make Joab the villain and to make Abner as much the hero as he can. He did not deserve to die like this. His hands, he, he, was, not, he was not a captive. He did not die in battle. He deserved better than what he got. He died like, uh, uh, like somebody would get mugged on a street corner. You know, and but keep in mind that this is also the person that has been uh, uh, with Saul hunting him through most of the time. But he understands, David understands uh, men. He understands circumstance. He understands warfare. He understands politics. But he also understands that God has a plan and a place. And he also understands that there's something about wrath and vengeance that is unbecoming. Think about it. Think about it. When did David learn that? Because David was as quick-tempered a person as there was. And he, he and wasn't afraid to fight. So when was it that David finally found out that, you know what, going off the top of my head to hurt people is not becoming of someone that's going to be the Lord's servant. Do you remember back with, when he met his wife, Abigail? Do you remember she already had a husband, Nabal? And when Nabal decided he was not going to receive David and help him in his flight, he said, you know what? I got something for him. It won't be one fool left alive when I get done. But Abigail came out and said, you know what? That's, that is not becoming. This is just another fool doing foolish things that fools do. And who are you? You are the king. You are God's anointed. And so when it was his turn, he understood that it was not his place to take vengeance on Saul. 
He understood that it's unbecoming of me as the anointed to raise my hand against a fellow anointed, even if he was in error. There's a lot of us that have not learned that lesson. For sure, Joab and Abner hadn't. They were jo Joab was just waiting. You know what? One day he'll get his. But, or, but one day he'll get his by my hand. That's the difference. By saying if, uh, uh, Christians are taught through the Spirit to believe that vengeance belongs to whom? God. That he will repay it. And in him repaying the vengeance, he's also able to lift you up. Let's finish out the chapter, Brother McKinley. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swore, saying, so do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else, till the sun be down. So he continues the, the morning. He decides to fast for the whole rest of the night while the burial is being going on. Go ahead, bro. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as, who, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it was not the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. So he, he, under, he made, because he did that for Abner, in the people's eyes, he was innocent of that. Yes. He was not a betrayer. Yes, he is a warrior. Yes, he is a soldier. Yes, he is a king. But I'm not a base murderer. I don't make allegiances and then break them. Right? I don't stab people in the back. Right. So and he, he, he and the people begin to see that as well. But at the same time, remember, think about Israel. This is a fickle people. They're one way one day. They're another way the next day. How is it that after all this time, David is going to win the people back? There's no battle. There's no warfare. But there is this gesture in the face of the warfare. Because remember, these are not, this is the thing about it, church, is that these are not, this is not Israel versus the Philistines. All of these men are brethren, betraying each other, killing one another. And, and David has to be able to bring the people together so that they can move forward. Because he does have the charge of ridding the land of the Philistines and raising Israel up. Uh, but how can I do it if we're so divided? And so he provides this opportunity where he can, in sight of all the people, be able to say, I have nothing against the enemy. I don't have any enemies in Israel. I'm willing to, I'm willing to put this thing behind us that's been here and do what it is that God, what you all know, God has had me to do. I think we got a few more left on him. Let's go ahead and finish it out. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zeruiah, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. So here is... Here is the king now before the people. It's like, even though I'm anointed king, I will take the day. Yes, I, I have now established once again that I am the king. He says, but, I, he says, but I'm weak. He says, I, I'm tired. I'm tired. And I'm not, these people, this violence, brother against brother, all this stuff, he says, that's, that's not me. That's not me. And he says, the Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Not me. He could have, he, along with raising up Abner, why didn't he take Joab out and have him strung up? Why didn't he punish him? He broke the law, at least in spirit, if not in letter. But it's not for me. David's like, it's not for me to do that. I learned that a long time ago. The Lord has a way of taking care of offenses. 
and it doesn't involve me. Amen. It doesn't involve me. Amen. So once again, that's, the, that's, where we, that's, that's where he leaves us. That's where we'll leave it for this evening. But that's the lesson that I think we want to be able to take away is that there is enough, there's enough that we can drum up to, 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 to have against one another. There's enough ill will that we can drum up if we try to divide us and to, to make things difficult one for another. And it's, it's something about being close to people that makes people get on each other's nerves. Just in, just in a regular day. Yeah, I'll, I'll, they're right there, so I'll mess with them. My son and my daughter love each other, but they get on each other's nerves. Just, just a little. Just a little. And that's why he has his own room and she has her own room. Because you know, even though it's hard to keep one out of the other at times, but, one, but they also know, it's like, this is my space, this is your space. Because it's peace that has to reign here. David understands that. We as a church have to understand that. That through it all, through all the things that we might have against one another, there are small things can, uh, compared to the mission that the God that brought us all together has us on. We have a commission. We have a duty. We are supposed to be out there representing him to the lost. Those that do not know right from their left, as the Bible says. But how, who are we to show them if we act just like they do? So we had to be able to rise above and learn the lessons that we have. There's a reason why God provided those cities of refuge in the first place. Because with all of the mistakes that we can make, there has to be a place for grace. There has to be a place for mercy. There has to be a place of redemption and protection from those that would punish you. The city that we have is the city that's set on a hill. Our city of refuge is the church. It is the body of Christ that he has called us all to and we are all part of. And we need to be able to extend the same grace that we have under God's protection, under Christ's protection in, this, in the church, in his body, to all those that we know. So we should be able to say, if anyone is out there that does not know the pardon of their sin, does not understand what it is to be under grace, to be safe in the city of refuge, it's so easy to do. It's so easy to do. It's simply to hear the word, to believe it, to repent of your sins, confess that you believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, be baptized according to the word, and be able to allow that grace to be part of what you're doing. So at this time, we want to put the invitation forward, and if any of those have uh, prayer requests, we want to be able to put them forward as we stand and as we have our hymn of invitation. Thank you. God Almighty, once again, dear God, because of you and absolutely nothing of ourselves, Father God, you bless us to be in this place this evening, Almighty God, to hear and study another portion of your word, Father God, and we ask in Jesus' name, Father God, that you 
Help us to understand what does say the living God, that we may be able to apply your word, your truth to our very lives, that we can live a more Christ-like life. Yeah. Father God, we are uh, thankful to Brother Bill this evening for that <coughs> awesome lesson, dear God, of uh, uh, how we are to go in the house how of God. God. Greetings, church family. On behalf of the health ministry, I wanted to provide a few tips to keep us all safe and healthy during this flu and cold season, especially with the COVID cases rising. Here are a few precautions. Get vaccinated against COVID-19 and the flu as vaccines are made available. Consume a well-balanced diet of fresh fruits and vegetables. Manage chronic diseases and conditions. Cover your mouth and nose when you cough or sneeze, but never use your hands. Instead, cough or sneeze into a tissue or your elbow. Always throw the tissue in the trash and immediately wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water. This is one of the most effective ways to prevent spreading germs and getting sick. Of course, if soap and water are not available, use alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol to clean your hands. Please continue to monitor your symptoms, and if you don't feel well, stay home and keep your distance from others. Additionally, you should follow up with your primary care provider for further guidance. Wear a mask while in large crowds where there is an increased risk of encountering germs. And when in doubt, Get checked out. Make sure you seek health care when you have any questionable signs and symptoms. Please take care of yourself and others. Thank you. Well, oh, 
overtaken by the love of Christ. I made a vow to give him my life at the potter's table on the potter's wheel. Mold and shape me, Lord, that I may be filled and live in memory. What you did for me, for me. Oh, yeah. How you set me free, set me free, set me free. At the start Calvary, yeah. I want to be one of yours. I want to be a worthy vessel. A one that is ready. One that's ready. I want to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. Lord, I want to do, do, do just what, what you want, want me to teach me and show me do, do, truly do, how to love, do, do, just do, like that sacrifice do, do, from heaven above. Do, do, Perfect union had never been broken. Stronger words had never been spoken from you. It is finished. Teach me how to finish a copy love from heaven above. Want to live in memory? I want to live. How you set me free? What you did set me free? Heavenly, heavenly. I want to be a worthy vessel. Want to be used. Want to be used by you. I want to be. I want to be a worthy vessel. I want to do, do, do. One that's ready to be used by you.